Hey, Yang. John, park here. I have just returned from Las Vegas. And I think we're live. So I'm going to check out my chat setups here. Oh, i got to find this one. All right, bear with me. This one is uh, in Discord. Hi, I'm live. And... In old YouTube here, let's see how easy it is to find. That thing's tiny. Ooh, this thing needs some power. Otherwise, we're going to lose chat ability. <laughs> oh, it's the weird uh, dark cave of thinking you've gone live, but seeing no activity in the chat. Sorry for the surprise, uh, very little warning that I was going live. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to uh, get it ready in time because I was just traveling. Oh, I see that. That's good. Thank you, Brian. And I've got a safari session here. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to check the YouTube chat, but it's not wanting to come up. And I know we're making our, our move towards um, Discord pretty pretty seriously, so if I don't get this thing to come up here in a second, I'm going to have to bail on YouTube chat. Oh, this is starting to come up. Hey, that, that looks like the link. At the risk of pulling some things apart, I'll show you today. I'm using my iPad for chat inside of the frame I'm building for my uh, next version of the pinball controller. So this is made out of the uh, extruded, extruded V-slot. Someone corrected me. This is actually V-slot, not T-slot, which has to do with the profile. Uh, V-slot aluminum uh, sort of table I'm building for it. So that was a little sneak preview, but I didn't feel like extracting it out of there for this. So I am... Uh, I am going to use it inside of this mount. The YouTube on my Safari on the iPad is acting super slow, but Discord seems to be good. I'm going to risk for one second checking which of my multitude of Wi-Fi networks I'm on. Hmm. I'm going to, yeah, I'll leave it on that one. That one's decently close by. And here's the chat. OK. Good. So we're in a couple of chats. That could be chaos. But if anyone can place the Discord uh, chat link inside of YouTube, that would be awesome. And let's get started. So. First up, what I'll be making today uh, is going to be some testing of the mount that I modeled and 3D printed last time. So uh, here you can see this is the clevis that I made in the last week's video. I modeled this inside of a CAD program called Rhino and then 3D printed it. Um, oh, I'm lying. That's the top one. That's not the one that I made. This is the one I made last time, this little bottom one. Uh, and this is nice because this new design will give me a wider range of motion of the base of the actuator versus the old design, which I think is that one. There, it was um, just a little taller in this par part, so I was hitting the base on the bottom there. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be taking a look at primarily today, but I also wanted to um, <clears throat> give an update on what I've been up to. So I just traveled to Las Vegas for a few days to 
uh, helped put on a number of performances of a thing called, uh, you can see it right here, the 49 Boxes and the Magic of Floyd G. Thayer. Uh, so this is, uh, we, we put this on at the Orleans Casino Hotel at an event called Magic Live, which is a big, I, I think it's the biggest of the magic conventions, at least in the U.S., uh, targeted at professional and hobby amateur magicians. So it's all kinds of seminars and talks and performances within uh, all sorts of disciplines of magic. And we had this opportunity with, um, I worked with a guy named Michael Boris, who has created this uh, event called the 49 Boxes, which is sort of like, a, someone described it as a reverse escape room. Um, it is a really interactive storytelling uh, event that is sort of like solving the puzzles of a game like Zork or a game like Myst inside the real world. So it's a, uh, I don't know how much I'm supposed to say about this because it's not super publicized, but what the heck. We're an intimate little crowd of Adafruit uh, makers here. So the event takes place in uh, a closed room and a number of participants are greeted. There's a storyline that runs throughout and then there are all of these boxes, puzzle boxes and mystery boxes that are distributed among the people. And at the uh, signal, everyone starts opening their boxes and discovering the puzzles and working through uh, puzzles in their box, but also in collaboration with other people and their boxes or the solutions from their boxes. It's a mind-blowing event. Uh, I hope they're able to start doing more of these and bring it out to, to more people. So I was uh, sort of a technical director type and, and built illusions and uh, effects and props for it. So I got to go and participate and also help maintain some of the uh, effects and boxes that I had built. So it was a tremendous event, got very little sleep. So I hope I don't lose my voice in the middle of this and I'm sure I look terribly haggard and tired, but it was, it was fantastic, really cool event. And um, another thing to say is that at this event, there was a dealer's room where they sell all sorts of props and magic effects. It's fascinating. If you're interested in this sort of stuff and you like making these sorts of things, it's really uh, informative and inspiring to go and see the types of things that small companies, sometimes just a one person shop, sometimes bigger companies are making uh, within, within magic. Uh, and I'm very excited about, sorry, I've just been talking while you looked at that. I'm very excited about my new t-shirt I got there, which is this Tannins, uh, which is a magic shop in New York, a famous old magic shop in New York. Tannins Magic Mystery Box, it says on it. So a little story behind this is when I saw it, I was like, wow, that's familiar looking. Oh, this is the question mark that was on the side of the mystery box that J.J. Abrams uh, pretty famously described in a talk, I think in a TED talk, and then there was a Wired magazine uh, issue where this was on the cover, this cardboard box with a big question mark on it. And JJ talked about how he had, I don't know him, so I shouldn't just call him JJ like he's my friend, but JJ Abrams talked about how he had bought this thing as a kid. I think he'd spent his own $20 and has never opened it because he was so excited about the mystery of what might be inside of this box that he has till this day never opened it. He still has it sitting there looking a little worn uh, and worse for, for the wear. Uh, and he talked in this article in Wired, at least, about how he likes to use that in his shows and in his movies, this notion of an unknown thing. Um, sometimes this is a MacGuffin, right? I think that's a MacGuffin. Um, so he has someone answer me in the chat. Is that a MacGuffin? I think that's a MacGuffin. So um, this is the shop, and they had a booth there, and they were selling all kinds of great tricks, but I had to get a T-shirt with the cool question mark on it because I seem to be in the mystery box business a lot lately. So, uh, Also, one other bit of news is I will be at Maker Fair New York City in September doing a talk about some of the mystery boxes I've made and I'll bring some of them and talk about the inner workings and show how they were built. So uh, a little plug there for Maker Fair in New York City, World Maker Fair, very exciting. In September uh, 17th, 19th, somewhere around there. I'm not good with dates. Um, okay, so the... Last thing about the Magic Live event is they had a vending machine with playing cards in it, which was pretty darn cool. And uh, I was very excited to be able to feed three bucks into the vending machine and press a button and have a deck of cards drop out. And it was all different bicycle brand. They were the ones who sponsored this uh, kind of break room. All sorts of bicycle cards. And there were some exclusive ones for the event with gradations of red to black and red, black to, uh, red to blue and blue to red, depending on the suits. Uh, anyway, I just 
dug this one, it was only $3, so I thought we could open it and have a look at these cool skull bicycle cards. Also, I've been traveling, so that means I don't have my knife in my pocket like I usually do. I have it in my little tool bag. Actually, this was, I posted a bunch of pictures online on Instagram and Twitter of, uh, this was the little tool bag that I put together um, to carry to the convention. Actually, I actually had to stick it in my um, luggage because it has blades and things in it. There's my knife. So that's a knife I normally have in my pocket. But uh, yeah, if you want to check out the contents of what I brought to be able to repair things, uh, check on Instagram, John Edgar Park on Instagram, or Twitter, J. Edgar Park on Twitter. So let's check out these super rad skull cards. Uh, I hope Stuff with Kirby is on here, because I know Stuff with Kirby. There you are. You, uh, you didn't miss too much, Kirby. I was just talking about the event I was just at, uh, working on a sort of puzzle room thing with the mystery boxes. But this is that deck of cards I got in the bicycle vending machine. So, yes, look at that. Ace of spades. Pretty cool. Pretty standard on this side. You got a double-backed one. I don't know any card tricks. I know one, but I'm not going to show it to you. Um, yeah, it's kind of fun being at a magic convention and not being a magician. There might have been others, but I felt like the only one who was really there to... has more of a prop builder, effect builder type. All right, so those are the cool bicycle skull cards in Adafruit Black. Okay, so... Um, so the actuator, someone asked about it. How can you make one for a simulator? How does it connect with a game? Ooh, these are great questions. So um, this is a linear actuator, and it has a DC gear motor here. Uh, I should take one of these apart sometime. Um, maybe after we do this, that would be kind of fun to look at it, and maybe I won't get it back together exactly, but what the heck. So there's a gear motor here, and it turns a uh, screw that this... I think we can take this off, maybe. That this, um, no, maybe not. Oh, yeah, it's coming off. Okay, so here's a little ball screw uh, or lead screw in here that turns when the motor turns, and it pushes a nut up or down, uh, which in effect causes this actuator um, end, this end effector, would you call it that in this? Maybe not, uh, to travel up and down. And uh, let me demonstrate that. So. This one uses, there, there are kind of a variety of these. This one is a sort of moderate simplicity. Um, we don't have like servo feedback or anything with it, but we do have limit switches at either end of the range. So uh, it will stop itself. You don't have to be responsible for stopping the thing from um, grinding up the gears. So is this plugged in? Am I going the wrong way? Let's see. I'm traveling back. Oh, yeah. So, and all you got to do is reverse polarity on these. They're dead simple. It's DC motor. So I'm, I'm uh, center positive on this is a 12 volt, 3 amp uh, regulated switching power supply. So I'm going to put the blue, which is the ground essentially, into the center positive, And I'm going to put the red onto the ground. And that's to go backwards. And it just stopped because it hit its, its little limit switch. And then if I reverse that polarity, I don't have a fancy switch set up yet to do that. You can see, whoops. Keep contact with it. Um, so that's its most basic operation. And then what I plan to do, oh, I've fallen out of the camera, that little camera. Oh, that's pointing way over there today, sorry. Um, what I plan to do with it is run it from a motor driver. Um, I'll probably use a feather and a uh, motor driver feather wing. So the feather is one of the little Adafruit microcontrollers. And uh, this is for a project where I'm going to use some wireless uh, packet radio transmissions between one area where a puzzle is solved and then another area where the actuator is going to reveal something or open something. something. Um, so I'm not decided yet exactly what that's going to be. One idea I had, this is a, a decent throw. I think this is a six-inch throw. Um, so that's enough to raise it up. 
to switch cameras again. That's enough uh, to raise this up and lift something up out of like a pedestal. Um, so maybe build uh, a box. This is just a plywood box that I mostly used to stand on in the shop. But uh, if you imagine the actuator inside of here with a little uh, wooden platform and, a, and essentially another box sunk inside of it, maybe with an opening on the side like a shelf, uh, we can raise this up and then there can be something to, to extract as a uh, payoff for solving a puzzle. That puzzle, I've shown it before. I won't grab it um, right now because it's kind of buried under parts of its own um, inner workings. But I have a chessboard that I'll be placing a reader, an RFID or NFC reader inside of, that will read two pieces, two particular pieces. Uh, chess pieces will need to be placed on two particular spaces on the board. And when that happens, uh, so there's going to be some puzzle solving to, to find the pieces, to figure out which are the correct pieces, where they need to go. And when that happens, then we're going to throw the uh, linear actuator. So what I wanted to do is just take a, um, a quick look at, um, I'm, I'm checking, sorry, I'm just checking the chat real quick here. Let me, uh, someone said, what's the voltage? This is, yeah, this is 12 volt. Um, and... Someone had asked about using it, I think, in a game. So if you're, t I think someone's talking about, like, for a motion base. Uh, so there are much bigger actuators that are used for uh, motion bases, which are what you see in, like, a flight simulator or other uh, rides at, at, uh, in malls and museums and entertainment places. And those usually have uh, an arrangement. Uh, they often have an arrangement of six sets of actuators to essentially move you on all axes. And those are big. Uh, you could probably make a small version of that to use for something kind of lighter that you're moving around. Um, and the real skill in that, besides just like power requirements and physically setting it up, is software. So being able to um, properly drive linear actuators to all work in concert with each other based on, let's say, the 3D motion of something inside of a game engine. Um, I've seen it done, uh, data coming out of something like Unity uh, and then going into um, often custom software that's creating the proper mix of um, motion on the, on the linear actuators to move this coordinated movement. It's very complicated, sophisticated um, inverse kinematics type of work in software. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a real trick to get them to not bind and, and, and fight against each other. But uh, you could certainly do it for, I, I think it would be a lot of fun actually to try going out of something like Unity, a uh, game engine, and taking some data just to move one axis or two axes, uh, running that data through a microcontroller that you have uh, connected to, the, to your computer. Um, that would be pretty cool. That could be fun. Let's see. If you want to go faster and carry more weight, uh, I, gosh, the, I'm trying to remember now. Someone on here who's dealt with these will remember this. There's kind of two big companies that, um, that sell the, the, the motors for these motion bases, but they, it can get into the hundreds of thousands of dollars for like flight simulator si sized ones. So I haven't looked that closely personally uh, at, at, at pricing out the, the motors and the controllers. Um, so, all right, let's take a look. Okay, so, so what I wanted to do, so I built, built these um, clevises so that we can rotate. I'll put that in that camera. And I have here, this is a typewriter case. If you're wondering why this typewriter is sitting here, this is an old Remington typewriter I got uh, at a yard sale for a good bargain. Um, and this is actually inverted. Normally the typewriter sits on this tray and the big top pops open, but I wanted to kind of test this out as a lid that might open and maybe we would even try to conceal the linear actuator, though today I'm just kind of concerned with uh, getting it to, to do its thing. So what I was thinking of doing so I don't have to uh, use adhesives or screw into this case is I'm going to cut a couple of little pieces of this uh, board, I think it's like a one by six, and just set them in the top and the bottom. Uh, I can 
kind of just press fit them in there. They won't move too much. And then I'll screw down the actuator to the base. So if that sounds like a plan, let's measure out a, this is longer than my board. <laughs> but I, oh, you know what? That'll work because this is, can you see this? Let me flip, flip cameras real quick here. Uh, so the top of the case actually has this little piece of hardware that the typewriter slides into, so I don't need the full size there. I think I can get away with, let's try, yeah, let's try 11 inches there and a little under 13 here. Let's do uh, 12 and 3 quarters on that one. So let's mark this up. And grab a square. Okay, so that's our 11 that we'll have a little extra remaining on the other side we'll have to trim off. But let me cut that off. So I'll switch the cameras. I don't have one on pointed right at my bandsaw, but you can kind of see it over here. I'm going to swivel the camera a little bit, actually. And this will, this will be the fun, loud part of this. I won't turn off my mic, so you can um, experience the workshop in its noisy glory. But I'm going to put on some hearing protection so, and some safety glasses. Measure twice, cut once. Yeah, let's remeasure that. Thank you, whoever said that. Uh, This is a piece of scrap material from another project. I don't remember what this, what those holes are for, actually. What the heck was that for? Oh, I know. I made some, it was for some, like, gymnastics equipment, some handstand canes I made. This is where, this was way too flimsy wood for it, so I pulled it off. Oh, that's not going to work on that. All right, so let's, uh, I'm going to use my miter saw. We could just saw this by hand, but I think it's more fun to use power tools. So uh, let's see, how much time do we have? Do we have enough time to, we have a half hour. That's probably enough time to make a big mess. Sure. So let me move this out of the way and I'm going to, I've got a miter saw that I can put up here. I like portable tools because then I can put them in camera view for stuff like this. So let's. Test that theory and throw sawdust everywhere. It might fit there. Let's see. I probably got to move that typewriter. I'm going to move this. I was cutting some, I've got an upcoming project where I'm cutting some uh, kind of like picture frame. And so this is very useful because it has detente at various common angles. So I had this thing set up for um, 45 degree cuts. So let's fix that. All right. And how did I lose? There they are. in clamp that's better than nothing. <laughs> Out of my back pocket. That's a big back pocket. I can never remember where that There's 
one piece. And that was our 11. Yep. And then this guy just needs about a quarter inch taken off of it. All right. Oop, sorry, camera. This has one of these little uh, shadows that shows you where the line is going to be. I'm going to, I can show you that. Let me grab this. It's kind of cool. You've probably seen this. I just think it's groovy. All right, hopefully this camera doesn't mind too much. Okay, so you can see here where the, there's basically a light pointed straight down the blade. And uh, when you turn it on for a second, you get that little line. I think you can see that little shadow line. That's exactly where the blade is going to go. I think that's awesome. I know there's ones with lasers and stuff too. Um, but this one's nice because there's not anything to calibrate. If that shadow is in the right spot, it's because the blade is in the right spot, which I think is really clever. All right, so what do we need? A quarter inch? A quarter inch. How did I lose that pencil already? This is what happens when you move stuff. Here, pencil, pencil, pencil. There it is. I talk to myself like this even when I'm not live streaming. I bet you are not surprised to hear. All right, measuring twice. So that'll end up at yeah, a little a little over 12 and a half, which is good to fit in that part of the case. You found my pencil, Kirby? Thank you. Let me go a little shy of that. Hmm, I think I just saw oil drip out of the back. Or that was some sawdust. I know I lubed this up a little while ago. Good. All right. Okay, let's put this guy away. That was a lot of effort to make two saw cuts, but there you go. Oh, and look, now there's sawdust everywhere. I'm just going to sweep that up real quick. I just hook a shop vac up to the back of that one sometimes. <laughs> yeah, have someone just said in the chat, I think on the YouTube chat, it's good to live stream so that other people can help you find the stuff in your shop. It'd be kind of good to just put cameras everywhere and collectively help organize each other's shops. I like that idea. Okay. So, let me get the case back here and our actuator. So let me switch the camera. There we go. That's the most useful thing I've ever made, that little camera switcher for this stuff. A lot of use out of it. So this will, I'm just going to set this in here and this up here. I should have made that longer. No, that's okay. Um, and let's see if we can wedge this piece in. No, still not. Yeah, oh, I see. I thought it was going to stop there. It's not really going to stop there. That's OK. Something like that. 
All right, why don't we just try it? So here is the actuator. I'm thinking something like, oh, this is big enough. <laughs> Let's see if this will go sideways. These things are big enough that I might not Did I make it. Oh, yeah. I'm just worried about where the motor part of this will end up when it's standing. So it's got to be off about like that. Turn this right ways for you. Okay. And this will be connected up here like that. All right, so it's no harm in just trying this one. I've just got some little wood screws here and just a couple of those ought to do. Let me grab a little impact driver. These little guys, these are useful for small screwing jobs that don't need to be too precise. Or, I guess it's not a matter of precision, but doesn't have to be too uh, powerful. And yeah, let's see if this will fit in there. All right, yeah. Okay. And just another one in the corner here. So you do want to keep this uh, in line with the axis of, of rotation for the hinge uh, that we're going to be traveling. Um, but you get some leeway because this can actually rotate on a couple of axes. So if things are slightly off, you've got a little bit of slop in there. Um, but not much before it would get angry about the twist. So I'm going to try to keep that pretty square. If you were doing a very uh, precise job about this, you'd compare it to a reference of 90 degrees to this board and then get the board at 90 degrees to the uh, box, presuming the box is 90 degrees to the hinge. Does that make sense? Oh, iPad just decided to hide you all. It's charging, though. Oh, that's weird. Discord just got small. All right. Someone borrowed your drill press for R2-D2 parts. That's cool. All right, so that one's good. This is the one that's a little janky because I didn't, I don't have a good way to jam this in here, really. Um, but what we'll try is I'm going to, Let's see, if we wanna, so let me switch the other camera for a second here so you can see the question here. I'll aim that at the camera. Okay, so uh, the actuator can go all the way down when this, when this is in. Uh, and we could start, I think we would have the most mechanical advantage by being farther out when we start rather than uh, closer to the hinge. So if we start towards the end here, uh, we can only open this far. So depending on how far you want to open it is where the um, connection should be made at the full extension of the, the actuator. Um, let's try it at kind of the full, full extension here just, for, just to see what that's like. And I think, I'm trying to think of a good non-destructive way. I may try to just use some wire uh, to wrap this board a little bit in place uh, because we have these. Let me switch cameras and show you. We've got, uh, let me slide this over here. We've got these pieces of hardware, these little cool spring loaded uh, releases for the typewriter, and they have a little hook on them. So I, I think I'm just going to try to wrap that down there with some wire, which I. Again, would love it if someone saw where I put that wire because I recently was using it for something and I think I put it away in a new place because I didn't like where I had it and now it seems to be gone. It's just some like bailing wire kind of steel wire. No? 
here's a piece of chain. Let's see if we get lucky on this. A couple little pieces of chain. These were, there's always a story with everything. These were actually what held the uh, overhead lights in place in the shop. No, I don't think that's going to work. So I can't get any. No, oh, maybe. All right, let's try this. That's terrible. That's never going to work. All right, I give up. I'll use gaffer's tape. It does not take long to go straight to gaffer's tape in a case like this. Gaffer's tape is magic because it does not leave any permanent residue. So how about right there? across the top. It would look medieval with the chain. That's a good point. All right, that's good enough for what we're doing. Cool. So let me grab a couple more screws and we will screw this top clevis in. About, yeah, there, how about that? That'll give us the full, full extension. And this is getting a little tricky to do one-handed, but we can flip this thing if we need to. Let's go ahead and do that. sneak around that bolt I'm using as a clevis pin. I just like saying clevis a lot. I've said it so many times it ceases to have meaning. All right. There we go. Uh, so let me point this other camera down so you have a close and a wide shot. Do, 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 do. Sorry for a second. Breaking the camera. There we go. All right. And I'm going to switch those cameras actually because the cooler shot. Oh no, now I've broken everything. All right, let's go back to that. Okay, so let's uh, close this thing up and see how it goes. It is kind of nice that this motor is just directly driven. You can just put power on it uh, so you can test it before you get your microcontroller involved. Well, that's not going to close that way. Yeah, all right. So that's a very important discovery. That's as far closed as it'll go. I'm sure some of you were screaming that you saw this coming, right? Predicted it. Okay, so now let's try to correct that for a full close because that's actually way more important than just getting this thing uh, open super wide. Reopen it. And we'll do that by changing just the top position. Hey, hey, come out. There you go. Out, out. Not quite. Okay, so I'm gonna 
close this thing down to its shut position. Okay, so that's where we're going to want to... Ooh, I wonder if this motor is a little bit in the way. Actually, it looks just level, so that shouldn't be a problem. Let's pull the cord over here. Does it close? this up so you can see. No, okay, so my addition of this board being as big as it is is, is hitting the, the motor there. So let's trim that down a little bit and we'll just uh, keep this taped up piece here as a mount. Uh, so I'm going to take this just over to the band saw and let me fix that camera. Good. So let's just see where that's hitting. Yeah, make a little mark. So yeah, I've lost a you know decent amount, probably like four or five inches total of the height uh, inside of this case, just because I've placed these this large-ish uh, piece of wood and it's not sitting all the way on the bottom. Uh, so like four or five inches, three three four inches of. Uh, wasted space, which means that this is bumping into the, into the uh, top of the case. So that's a consideration, you know, if you've, you've always got some trade-offs with how big the motor is versus how much space it's going to take up. So let me grab some glasses. I'm just going to trim this up real quick. The loud show today. Um, yeah, so that'll clear there. Looks good. And also, by the way, part of this is still to do with my clevis design, right? Let me lift this up so you can see. Um, it will not extend fully, so I could redesign this to be a taller and flatter arm on this side of the clevis. Can you see that? Sorry. Um, so that this will set all the way straight down. Uh, I think we'll be okay as it is, but that's part of the, the design of that shape there is uh, determines how far it can rotate. Okay, so yeah, let's just try putting that back. Was and I'm going to flip this again and screw that into place. Let me switch cameras for you. Okay, who sees my little impact driver? Is it behind here? Yes. Does it close? Oh, yeah, I guess I shouldn't screw that right back in where I had been before. Sorry about that. One more time. You can't plan this stuff. This is the good guy screwing it up over and over again. Kind of TV. Pretty much at the top. 
Uh, let's see, is that going to be easier if I extend it? I think it'll be a little more apparent. There you are. This board is too high. Okay, so this um, in the base is sitting about a half an inch or an inch off of the ground because of this little bevel in here. So I'm going to go ahead and trim this up too and just tape it in place so that this will fit. So back to the bandsaw. Yeah, the clearances were good when I was looking at this and then I ruined all that by using this wood in there. Looks like it'll close, other than I've got the cord coming out of here. Is that what's hitting? Yeah, maybe. Maybe we go to thinner wood, but we'll try one more try with that. Uh, yeah. Let's try this, but you know what, I also had an idea of, I have a couple little thin pieces of scrap I was thinking of using in case um, this wood was too thick, but I can't use a wood screw down through it, so I'll have to put a bolt up through the other side, which is fine. Um, but, where did I put those two wood screws? There they are again, why does everything hide back here? What am I going to be disappointed about? I'm ancient, that's right, yo. Oh, I'm not 50, though. No offense. Okay. I suspect this is still going to be a little shy of closing up, but let's at least try the effect, and then if we want, we can uh, use the little uh, smaller pieces of wood. Okay, so there it is. Let me switch to the far camera so you can see it, and it's mostly closed. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> I need to tape down that bottom piece, don't I? Just made it angry. Let's see if that bottom piece stays put. It's a little better. Pretty cool. All right. Um, so that's going to be the basic idea of opening this thing up uh, if you were using a box like this. I think what I really want to do, because um, the obvious problem here, you can tell, is that there's a giant actuator there. So if this is meant to be a, a cool secret box opening up, you maybe don't want to see that in there. So um, depending on what the final either trunk, if I use like a steamer trunk kind of design, it may be easier to hide. Uh, some of this mechanism, if, you, if we have more space and put um, like uh, velvet padding and that kind of stuff, like hide things off to the side. I've done that before with like lock boxes. 
Uh, or I kind of really like this idea of the pedestal, so you, you don't see the actuator at all. It's really um, not even doing this hinging motion, but is going to sit inside of something like that box I showed and raise, raise something up. I think uh, that might be cool. One thing I was playing with is I grabbed a bunch of these drawer slides that someone was just put on the side of the road. I think they're IKEA drawer slides. And um, these are nice-ish bearing slides, pretty low friction. Um, so we could potentially mount a couple of these or four of these inside of a box and place our um, inner box that's going to raise up and down on that. You can also use this for, for opening a drawer, which might be kind of cool if we have a drawer that needs to open and we can just uh, lock up the drawer that's beneath it and it never opens, it's just shut. That's where the entire actuator could sit and then when, when the actuator goes, it will just push open the drawer that's above. Um, that one could be really cool. Uh, it might be the neatest one to do. It's also the least amount of um, sort of energy required to push this drawer out on a linear bearing versus raising something up. The thing you're raising up with this little actuator probably can't weigh too much. Um, so if I can come up with a small, neat little drawer thing, I might build uh, something that has, has these as the... Uh, as the drawer slides, uh, maybe this high, it has like two, three drawers in it and just the top one opens up that I can um, make about this big. That might be a, a kind of cool way to do it. So um, let's see. Don't need to automatically close it again. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, turn, turn the actuator around and it will fully open someone's. All right, let's play around with it. So I think what I'll do just so that we're not futzing around with uh, the wood and losing the space from this is maybe what I should have done from the beginning. I'm just going to use some of that double stick foam tape that I have that does not uh, seem to leave residue. It's the sort of denser stuff. Where'd the roll go? This stuff here, I like it because it uh, doesn't kind of pull apart like that foamier cheaper stuff and leave a bunch of gunk. It's, it's dense enough that it kind of defeats the adhesive versus the other way around. So, um, so let's just try using tape in a couple of configurations, uh, which is a really good idea. I probably should have done that instead of wood from the beginning just so we have a, oops, uh, a better chance of trying a lot of things, iterating a lot of things, because obviously you can Whoop. You can tell I'm not calculating this stuff out on paper first. I'm just doing it by eye. Um, so what was I doing like that? Isn't this how I was doing it? So you're saying flip it around. All right. Let's see what happens there. Who said this? I want to know. Uh, oh, man. my. There we go. My chat had gotten real small. Huh, that's so weird. Most of the chat is over on YouTube today. I'm, I'm uh, screwing up everyone by getting somehow our chat back over to here. Pneumatic RAM, that would be cool. Turn it around. John Hamilton So turn around. All right, John. Let's get some scissors. Give it a shot. See that? Just a nice little piece. Tape there. And let me see where uh, we're at in the extension of this. Is it fully extended? Looks like it. So like that. Okay, yeah, let's give it a shot. I was worried that this would require more force because we're so close to the hinge. But uh, it generally will just stall. Um, if it doesn't like it, it doesn't seem to uh, get too angry or too hot or burn out. But I'm stopping. I'm not applying any more power when that happens. All right, so let's switch cameras. 
and square things up. Okay, so we'll do it again just from the middle of it. So if that's there, and I guess I I have to have a little extension when I do that. Okay. Um, yeah, this this hinge actually comes off on the back, which when it's open, which could make it maybe easier to fit this in here, but I'm just going to extend this a little and connect it mostly closed, like the amount that my arm is in the way, and see what happens. Okay. Oh, that tape didn't work. <laughs> this thing's a little too old and dusty for this tape. that hinge coming off. Oh yeah, it just peeled off a bunch of crud. I would probably have to clean that better to use this. Let's see if it just cleaned itself. A little bit of pressure. All right, here goes nothing. Oh, <laughs> that's not gonna happen. Let's see. One more attempt, I'll use that thin piece of wood and bolt through it, and then we have something bigger we can tape on. Um, where did I move those to? Here they are. So I'm just going to attach these a little more permanently to the ends, and then that's a bigger area that I can tape onto there and try some new positions. All right. Let's get, I have some little... They're kind of tiny, but I'll just try these little these uh, M2 and a half nylon screws just because I have them sitting right here. And I'll grab my little reamer tool here. Maybe the base, yeah, maybe the base can sit where it is because it's just gonna jam against there. Let's try that. mark that so I know where these are going and then pull it out of here so I don't go through the case. Those. Try not to break this. Let's see if that's big enough. Handle it. This is just some Baltic birch uh, plywood that I was using for some laser cut sh sort of shelves or drawers I built for someone just to hold little parts. Okay. So let's pop these up through the bottom. Like so. You know what, I'm going to ream out the back side of that a little bit to make those fit better. not want to go. Okay. And hmm, those are a little short. Let's see if we can get a nut on there or not. I think those are the longest ones I have left in this. I might have to switch. Let's see, do we have enough time? We have we have one minute. That's probably not enough time. All right, we'll we'll use that and tape. <laughs> to tape this to the board and then the board to that. So, super temporary, but at least it won't wiggle um, side to side as much because the nut 
or the screw being in there. Enough hands to do this. Yeah, someone was saying in the chat there are there are definitely more sophisticated ones that can read their position um, uh, with like a potentiometer in there, kind of like a servo uh, does, and I think also with different kinds of rotary encoders uh, inside, or maybe linear encoders. All right, so that, all right, we'll give that a shot. That's just gonna, uh, I don't really have the bottom stuck very nicely on there, but it should uh, just hold in place. Let me switch over to this view sideways, and so this was the flip the thing around experiment, take one. Dramatic, that looked cool. That worked pretty well. I like it. Let's close it back up. Ooh, yeah. That's much better, I think. Who is this? Who is who this at it, John? Someone admit. John Hamilton, right? You said turn this actuator around. Thanks. That's a cool bit of advice there. All right. Let's see. Am I ripping it off of the... Yep, we just ripped off of the tape there. All right. Well, that was exciting. Um, I'm going to try to refine that, obviously, if, I'm, if I end up opening something uh, that's hinging. But I'm a little more, like I said, interested in trying the raising and lowering in the pedestal uh, because there's no, nothing to hide in that case. Everything is internal. Or same with the, the drawer slide thing. Um, so I think that's it. I can answer a couple questions or um, if other people have tips and tricks on this um, that they want to share in the chat that we want to discuss. Uh, we can answer any questions now. So, let's see. I don't think I have anything to show on, over on the computer. So, that's the linear actuator. We talked about the Thayer box thing. By the way, this, um, I'll show this thing again. This 49 boxes mystery. Uh, the theme of this, this has been performed a few different times with different storylines behind it. And the theme behind this one was uh, Floyd G. Thayer, who uh, was a fantastic magician and uh, craftsman who uh, handmade tricks, magic tricks, that were sold. There's a, a great real old catalog, the Thayer, Thayer Magic Catalog, that I, I don't even know if it may still survive today. But uh, he handcrafted all sorts of really amazing tricks that would have hidden compartments. Uh, he was a, a great woodworker, so he did bowls that had inner workings that you couldn't see and all sorts of uh, amazing tricks. So if you're interested in some of that history of older craftsmanship in uh, magic trick making, check out Floyd G. Thayer online. I'm sure there are good books written about him and stuff, but uh, his, his magic catalog was kind of the theme for this mystery box thing that we, uh, that we worked on for the magic live performances. So. Floyd G. Thayer, really interesting uh, history there in magic. And uh, let's see, what was the current draw? I didn't check, but this is a three amp uh, motor. Uh, uh, I, think I, I think it's like 1.2 or 1.3, depending on the load, of course. But with the kinds of loads that it can push, I think it was like around 1.3 or a little more. So I'm using a three amp uh, power supply just to um, make sure that we don't um, draw more than we can take. Can the base be side of it? Connect hinge side first, then extend, then connect latch side. Yes. Um, all right, well, well, we'll pursue this more when I get uh, sort of the more the final design of what I'm going to be pushing and pulling. Um, not the hinge, but maybe the pedestal, maybe the drawer. And I will see you next week. Thanks, everybody, for 
coming in and checking out my workshop. Bye.